Hello again everybody and welcome back to Test Fly on the F-86 Sabre. Last time around we finished looking at the overall setup of the cockpit and got a feel for the overall layout and where everything is at and the overall system for the cockpit design and the cockpit layout. We also looked a little bit at the handling and got a basic feel for mainly at high Mach numbers. Now that's all that I really looked at last time, but that gave me an idea of what to expect once I do get it into the air and just something to I look forward to and something to work towards is getting back to that point so we can start to explore that stuff uh, a little bit further. So since this is a series about learning something from scratch, uh, one thing that I sh uh, sure have always noticed and that you probably notice too as you're getting into the flight sim or anything at all is that you end up in this cycle where you read about an action, perform the action, and then when you go back and read about it again in the manual or you know, just think about it on your own, what, uh, you know, what you accomplished and what you did, you start to pick up on things that you didn't notice before, and things that didn't make sense before make more sense after going back to the manual again and reading it. And I ran into three or four cases as I was re-watching those previous videos and went back to the manual to reference some, some things, so I'll point those out, uh, some little errors I made as I was going around the cockpit when I get into the air. But one thing that I also did find out was that if I go to the options, during one of the previous videos, I came to the Special tab and F-86. I looked at this Landing Seat Adjustment button, and I figured out that what this does is that, I believe it's depending on your airspeed, it raises your position in the seat. So it gives you better visibility out of the cockpit when you're on a landing approach. So that's actually very, very useful. Okay, so I think the best thing to do for now is just to go ahead and jump into the cockpit. What I have in mind for this next sortie is just a startup, high-speed taxi, and taxi back to the ramp and shut down. And by high-speed taxi, what I mean is taxi out to the runway, go through the process of takeoff all the way up to the point that I would rotate, and then abort the takeoff. Just so that I have a good understanding of how the aircraft feels as I'm going down the, the runway, what kind of dynamic forces are going to be acting on the aircraft, and I just get a feel for whether or not I have good controllability. and. I'm not getting myself in too deep if I try to do this full up and uh, do, the, do everything at once. And that is how it usually goes when you're learning a single seat aircraft for the first time. You don't just jump in uh, and take off, or at least you don't nowadays. In the Sabre days that might have happened occasionally, but yeah, you do the high speed taxi, get a feel for the aircraft, how it handles on the ground, and then progress from there to the full takeoff. So that's what I'm going to try to accomplish on this mission. I'm going to go with the cold start mission. That's going to put me on the ground in a setup where we can go through the entire startup and shutdown procedure. So I'll step to the aircraft and I will see you in a second. And picking up in the cockpit, I'm back at Kolki Sanaki. This must be one of the developer's favorite airfields in the world because, I don't know, something about this area, this airfield, and this general location, you just always find yourself ending up here one one way or another. But okay, I'm starting off in the cold start mission with a cold aircraft, so we get to go through everything. Now, I do have on my kneeboard, and I'll pull it up now, a copy of the flight crew checklist, and this is taken from a paper copy that I have. It's, uh, unfortunately, all of my, like, full-up TOs were destroyed in a, <laughs> a very unfortunate apartment link when, when I was deployed one year. But I did keep, manage to keep and salvage some of the checklists. This is one of them. It's the F-86F Sabre checklist. It's from the late 50s. It is for the F model, but I pared it down to only show the stuff that is applicable to the Dash 35, the Block 35 Sabre. And I'll have a link to where you can go to download this. And chances are, if you uh, looked at the forum thread that brings you here in the first place on the DCS forums, you've already seen it and uh, possibly have already used it. But I'll be using this as a reference as I go around and set the cockpit up, go through the engine start, taxi, high-speed taxi, down the runway, and then back into chocks for the shutdown. But, let me see, I mentioned before there were a couple little oversights or, I guess, uh, discrepancies in my description of some of the systems. Let me go back and correct uh, two of them that occurred to me right off the bat. I mentioned during the description that the NIS position would apply alcohol to the uh, to the uh, like the anti-fod screen that comes down the inlet screen that comes down. It doesn't apply alcohol. That's referring to another system. It applies bleed air, hot bleed air to the screen to do away with any ice accumulation. So that's one little discrepancy. 
And that's the sort of little discrepancy that drives me nuts as somebody who loves aircraft systems. The other one was my description of the bombing altimeter. I had mentioned that the red tick mark was going to give you a cue as far as when to release the weapon. The red tick mark is intended to be set to the target altitude, and then the indexer is going to give you the cue for when to release the weapon. So I'll get to this. This is a yeah, this is probably the best option when it comes to bombing is the manual pip system. And I'll get to that uh, about, I guess, two sorties from now. Okay, the other one... The other one will occur to me as I go around, but... Okay, let me get started now. Okay, I'm pulling up the checklist for the pre-flight check. So let me just go ahead and start, and... The, you've seen from the quick start guide and probably seen from other videos showing the startup and shutdown and some other features, it's very, very easy. But with everything else, especially in a simulation that's modeled to this detail, it's never as simple as that. So you can make it as easy as just throwing two or three switches. It really is a very, very simple process, firing up the engines and going. But you're, you're about to see that you miss a lot of detail and you miss a lot of the functionality of the aircraft and... In a lot of cases, you miss some pretty important stuff just following the uh, the quick start. So hopefully I can fill the gaps here, and at the very least, until the full up manual for the DCS module comes out, give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of extra systems knowledge. At least as far as my systems knowledge goes to this point, I am learning this uh, from scratch as well for the most part. Okay, so stick rip check. What this is referring to is just an overall security. Of the stick, so okay, it's obviously good to go. Seat belt and shoulder harness check, not applicable. Seat adjust, not applicable either. Rudder pedals adjust and unlock as I start to get my HOTAS set up here and actually get ready to uh, do this. Okay, rudder pedals adjust and unlock. There is no functionality required, but that is just my little cue as I'm doing right now to get everything resituated. Okay, then armament switches off. This is when the stuff starts to get a lot more important because if we come down to the armor panel I'd have a little cleanup work to do down here. I can see now that I have this switch set to guns by default. I need to put this to off otherwise I'm going to be in danger of firing weapons when I'm on the ground. So I want that one off. I'm just going to check the rest of these for... okay that's off. Okay these don't matter. Gun heater off. Okay auto doesn't matter. Nose tail, tail only. Okay I'll go to the... yeah that one does have a center position. And at the very least, even though that's not going to keep me from releasing a weapon, if I do inadvertently release a bomb on the ground, at least by having this switch in the center position, it's not going to arm the bomb. Which is a small consolation, but that's what uh, setting that to the center position will do. And that's it for armament switches off. Let me see, the only other armament related switch was over here, rocket intervalometer, that I'm not worried about for this one because... Well, correct me if I'm wrong, let me go to the external real quick. Yeah, I'm in a clean aircraft for this mission. Okay, so that part is complete. Throttle off, so verifying that my throttle is in fact off. Got it. Landing gear handle down. Got it. Engine master, engine ignition, at battery switches off. Okay, so engine controls. We learned last time that they're up here on the right. Okay, master switches off. Battery starter switches. Was that one of them? Yeah, battery starter switch off. And emergency ignition. That's bound to be one of these guarded switches. I've got air start, I've got fuel, densimeter. That's got to be referring to the air start switch. It's not labeled as emergency ignition, but that's what I would associate as being an emergency ignition switch. Anything labeled air start, I'm going to start thinking emergency ignition. So, okay, I'll take those as good. Speed brake switch to neutral. Speed brake switch will be over here on my throttle. And as I do this, let me go ahead and do this right now. I'm going to hit escape, go to adjust controls, because... I still have some setup work to do, so I'm going to go to F86 Reel. I'm going to come down to... Do I have something for the throttle? I have stick grip. I do not. Where would I be if I were a command that would control the speed brake? Flight control is where I would be, but you're not there. Uh, let's see here. Let me just go to all. I'll look for speed brake. If I don't find it within the next five seconds, I will pause and come right back. And as good as my word, I am back after a pretty embarrassingly long search. Okay, air brake on and off is what I was looking for. 
So let me go ahead and map those to my throttle. Air brake, this bank left. Air brake off. Okay, we'll map that to that position. Air brake on that position. Okay, so that's going to allow me to extend and retract the air brakes using pretty much that same, it's the normal air brake function that I have on my throttle anyway. So that's a good familiar position to have it in. So that is done. That is off in the center position, or I should say neutral. External power connected. Now here's where things start to uh, really get interesting. Because right now there is no power to the aircraft. I do have a battery, but the battery itself does not apply power to the starter. So there's no way to do a battery start on this aircraft. So what I need to do is contact the ground crew and request that the crew chief go ahead and uh, flip on ground power. Chief, turn on the ground power. Okay, so that's in work. So he's walking over, flipping the switch right now. Ground power is now on. Okay, now I have power. And, okay, yeah, I can hear things start to spin up. And incidentally, the uh, power receptacle on the Sabre, at least the ones that I've ever dealt with, is just forward. It's on the left aft fuselage, just forward of the left speed brake. That's where the receptacle is for the ground power connector. So that's going to apply power to the systems and right now I have power applied to all the systems so I there's no real difference between what you get from the ground power as far as what buses are powered than what you get from the main generator off of the or I say main generator the generator in this aircraft uh, coming off of the uh, the generator mounted on the engine so I have now full functionality of the aircraft electrical systems even though I do not have the aircraft up and running and the main generator on which can be useful and that allows us to, before we get to the engine start, run through a lot of checks and uh, do a lot of uh, verification the systems are working. As you'll see, that is a big part of getting the aircraft into the air. Okay, so I've got an external power. Line of gear position indicators check. So I've got three lights. I would expect a green. I don't know why I would expect a green for some reason, but... Okay, let's say I have like a little visual indication with a... I'll take that to be gear down indications. Okay, good enough. Okay, uh, here we are at oxygen reg. Check. Oxygen regulator is right down here. I have a demand reg that is set to full on. I also have a little lever right here. This is going to switch between normal oxygen and 100%. I want this for now when normal oxygen. And here's my quantity gauge, and this is at 4,000 uh, PSI. Yeah, well, yeah, for uh, gaseous oxygen, it, yeah, gox, that would be... 4, 000, that would be PSI. Okay, so that's a good quantity. Good setup on my reg. Okay, so I've got NIG suit reg valve. Check. NIG suit stuff is always back here. It would be just below the circuit breakers. Okay, not there, but does not matter. <laughs> short of uh, short of me getting that centrifuge mounted in here like I've always wanted, I'm not really going to worry about G's or NIG suits or straining maneuvers for that matter. Although that would be hardcore if you actually did, uh, did the maneuver or did the NIG straining maneuver as you uh, pull G's. But anyway. Okay, left circuit breakers in. Got it. Okay, ammunition compartment heat emergency shutoff valve to norm. Okay, that would be down here. We know that's, okay, that's associated with the, like the environmental controls, the stuff that's, I guess it's just bleed air coming off of the, uh, last stage of the compressor, so that will be down here somewhere. Okay, so I've got cockpit air pressure, I've got this switch, but I'm looking for a handle. That's the only handle I can see in the area that I would expect that to be. That is non-functional. I'm going to take that as either good or not applicable to this aircraft, so that might be a good, a good one just to scratch off the list, because I don't think it's there. Okay, cockpit air temperature control switch to auto. Okay, control switch right there. Okay, guarded. Guard up. Okay, that is in the auto position. Guard down. I'll leave it there. Cockpit outlet selector to floor. And I think as I mentioned last time that this controls where the air that is supplied to the cockpit goes. It can go to the floor. It can go to the uh, defrost up here. And depending on the aircraft, you always have one up here on the windscreen and depending on the block, you have more back here kind of mounted to defog the canopy as well. But that's going to have it strictly go into the floor for now. 
Okay, cockpit air temperature control rheostat as required. This is going to control how much heat is provided through the heat exchangers part of the system. I'll leave that in the middle position. Until I, unless I can find a more appropriate setting, I'll go with middle. It's not going to matter anyway. Okay, uh, air outlets, okay, got that. Cockpit air rheostat, got it. Cockpit pressure schedule switch, 2.75 PSI, got it. Cockpit pressure control switch to pressure. Okay, two position switch, pressure and RAM. Pressure applies normal cockpit pressure. RAM uh, essentially dumps the uh, dumps the cockpit pressure and provides RAM air for, it doesn't really do a good job of pressurizing the cockpit, but that can be useful if you get fumes in the cockpit to, to kind of clear everything out, or if you have like an overheat, too much heat coming in, dumping the, uh, dumping the pressure and going to RAM could do something. To help you, I don't, I'm sure that's not going to be modeled though, fumes in the cockpit or anything crazy like that. That would be cool though. Okay, windshield anti icing lever to off. Okay, my never ending searches for levers over here in this area. This is the only lever that I see. That might be it, or let me see. Okay, well, okay, I'll take it to being possibly this lever. I honestly don't know. I thought, I have a vague recollection of a smaller lever right up here underneath the throttle. I'm going to take this one as another one that just is not applicable to our model of aircraft and press on. That one. Okay, rudder trim switch off. Rudder twin, trim switch right there. Left, right. It's in the center position. I'll take that as off. And I can see a pattern emerging here. I'm starting at the left and I'm going to be working my way around left to right. And I know it seems like I'm taking a long time. Once you get the hang of all this stuff, you'll be able to breeze through this. Uh, doing a, It's essentially just checking off safe and normal. That's what it's really referred to when you hop into an aircraft. You're just doing a breeze around the cockpit, checking for off safe and normal positions on switches and systems. So once you get this down, you'll, you'll know right away what you have to, have to really check and what you can kind of breeze by and blow off. And you'll know 100% of the time it's already set there. Okay, lateral alternate trim switch to normal. Okay, this switch is right here. Okay, that is set to the up normal position, guard down. Got it. Flight control switch to normal. Okay, flight control switch, that'll be forward. Three position switch, alternate, normal, reset, center position, normal. Got it. Drop tank selector switch, all tanks off. Yeah, exactly right. All tanks off since we don't have tanks for this one, but yeah, I believe that does start in the all tanks off position, and then after startup, it goes to the appropriate position for where you have tanks, either outboard or inboard, or if you have both outboard first and then inboard after the outboards are depleted. Okay, so not applicable for this mission, although we will we'll check that out in a later sortie with tanks. And folks, I'm going to put a break in the video here and come back next time with a continuation of the sweeper on the cockpit, looking at different systems and verifying the switch positions are where we need them in order to effect a effective start. And I know I'm taking a long time here. The key on this, since it's documenting my learning process, is to take my time the first few times. Next time around, I'm going to be able to do this in like five minutes flat and get into the air. But for this time, it's all about learning the systems. So, lest I scare you off, feel free to stay tuned if you're interested in the aircraft systems. This is where you're going to get the majority of systems knowledge. It's in these next four or five videos. So, thanks again for watching. I will see you next time.